I'd like you to turn your turn in your Bible to Joel, and once you get to Joel, then I want you, Joel chapter 2, and then I want you to turn over to Jeremiah chapter 30. Now, I would recommend once you get to Joel to keep your hand there and then go over to, um, to Jeremiah chapter 30. I've entitled this today, Trouble, Trouble, and More Trouble. Of course, the world in which we live continues to unravel at the seams. As I've mentioned before, it's sort of like a softball that's had its day, and uh, that softball has been hit so many times that the seams have broken and all the guts of it are coming out, and it's this big, long trail. As you continue to try to play with that ball, it's just kind of, it's unraveling. Things are falling apart. Well, that's kind of the world in which we live, and, uh, and I have news for the people of the world who will uh, maybe hear this or watch this, and they'll say, well, but you know, this is just the phase. We've gone through this. Things are going to get better. Things are not going to get better. Things are not going to get better. Eventually, things will get more and more bad or worse. And um, as a matter of fact, the worst time that the world has ever known is yet to be experienced. And we believe we are getting close to the brink of that. Of course, governments today are corrupt, in court, including, including our own government here in the United States. Um, there's no question that the government is using COVID as a controlling factor um, for the people. Regardless of what you think of the vaccine, they're using COVID as a controlling factor on people. Um, uh, there's no question, and it's all a matter of control one way or another. Imagine the Speaker of the House saying to the House, if you don't wear a mask, you're going to be fined, you're going to be arrested, but right across the way in the Senate, they don't have to wear masks. Now think of how things have disintegrated, okay, in our country to where we have that such nonsense going on. And what's even worse than that going on is the fact that they can get away with it and they're not accountable to anybody because they have so much power and they figured it out how to control. Well, of course, that's not true. They are accountable to somebody. He's coming back, by the way, and he's not going to be happy with them and what they're doing. Now, as we turn to, uh, well, we'll get to Joel in just a, a moment, but let me say this as we get into Joel. Many times when the Old Testament prophets spoke, the message they gave us had more than one meaning, okay? More than one meaning. It was multi-layered as they gave it. Many times their words had layers to them. It can refer to something in their day, but it could also refer to something in the future at the same time. And this is one of the amazing characteristics of Scripture. I was talking to uh, Andy before the service today and, and talking to him about Joel and really how challenging of a little book it is, and that I, I believe that God gave us the multi-truths multi within the verses that we find there. And of course, one of the reasons for that is they did give prophecies that are, that are near or things they were going to soon go through, but these had a meaning down the line too. Of course, those uh, in-your-lifetime prophecies proved whether you were prophet or not. Because if you didn't speak the truth then you would be taken out and stoned. And so you were careful of what you said. Imagine that. By the way, wouldn't that be a good uh, bill to pass for Congress? <laughs> if you don't speak the truth, you're going to be taken out and stoned. I think that would be fabulous, personally. And while you're at it, put the lawyers under that as well. Um, just the thought. In Christian love. But honestly, it is one of the characteristics of Scripture. Before we even get to Joel, think about it, Psalm 22, right? That great Psalm 22, it's a messianic psalm, but David was talking about it in his day. And yet at the same time, you read it and you're saying, this is Jesus on the cross. As a matter of fact, he quoted from Psalm 22 when he was on the cross. Okay, you see that. You see other places where it talks about the king of Tyre, and yet you read it and you're saying, this is, this is Satan. It's talking about Satan. Yeah, but it was talking about the king of Tyre. 
the book of Daniel, uh, referring, scriptures referring to Antiochus Epiphanes. And, and uh, yet we read those and we say, well, this is exactly the way the Antichrist is going to be. Do you get the picture, what I'm getting at here? This is very important. Now, with the book of Joel, just like in chapter 1, when just like the locusts came through the nation or the land of Israel and devastated the land, the enemies are going to be coming. Human enemies, people, armies are going to be coming in the day of the Lord to devastate and persecute the nation of Israel. And of course, this will take place during a seven-year tribulation period. Okay? And so let me just mention this. Let's just weigh into our, our message today. The first thing I want to emphasize with you today is this. Future judgment is coming. Future judgment is coming. The day of the Lord will prepare the nation of Israel to receive their Messiah, who they rejected the first time around. Of course, that was Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Not only Israel's Messiah and Savior, our Savior and Messiah as well, because there's only one. And this day of the Lord will also punish the world for its rebellion towards God. Now, we talked a lot about that last week, about the world needs to wake up to this because there's an accountability coming. When man is going to be judged by God and he is going to have to answer to God for the way he is and the choices he's made. Now, I had you turn to Jeremiah chapter 30. It says this in verse 5. And by the way, we won't, because of time, we won't read verses 1 through 4, but we know that in the last days, the Bible tells us in the last days, God would bring the nation of Israel back to the land of Israel. They had been scattered for some 2,000 years, and God said they would come back in the last days. May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation once again. This is one of the greatest fulfillment of biblical prophecy that there's ever been. Never in history has a nation been scattered for that amount of time and not lost their national identity, and then God brought them back to their land. It is a, literally, it is a miracle. And by the way, that miracle continues because Jews are still going back to the nation of Israel, to the land of Israel, I should say. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 4. Five. It's talking about the day of the Lord. It says, For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling and of fear. Remember these words when we get to Joel, okay? We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness, okay? People in such pain and agony and anguish that they are just holding themselves and their faces are pale with fear. You might say, well, this is just an exaggeration. It is not an exaggeration. God says what he means and means what he says. Alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Do you see that? Jacob's trouble but he shall be saved out of it. Now, it's not talking about the individual Jacob in Genesis. It's talking about his seed, which is the nation of Israel. Remember, uh, Jacob, his name was changed to what? Israel. God gave him that name. It is the time of Israel's trouble. This future time when God, after dispersion, would call his people back to the land, they would possess it, and they had to be back in the land before the time of their trouble would take place. They're back in the land. They've been there since 1948. And friends, of course, you know, what's going on in the Middle East now is just all precursor. It's all warming up. It's, it's like a pitcher warming up to come into the game. But it's not a game. Okay? But that's the idea. Everybody's getting ready. Everybody's getting ready for that period of time. You see, here's the point. You might say, well, what about today? 
When we get to Joel in just a moment, understand this. The Old Testament prophets did not know anything about the period in which we live today called the church age. It was a mystery. When I say that, I am saying it wasn't talked about and it it isn't written about in the Old Testament and God says, I'm teasing you, I'm teasing you. Oh, we want to know. No, I'm not going to let you know. It's not that way. It's not talked about. So they knew nothing about it. So it's important that we see this morning as the prophets of old saw in their time. So I want you to see a new chart that we have. I call it, we call it the Mountain Peaks of Prophecy. The idea is not new with me. Uh, we've recreated this, uh, but you'll see this. Here's the Old Testament prophets. This is virtually how all of the Old Testament's, Testament prophets saw the future. All right, here he is, and there's a mountain peak. Here's a mountain peak. They understood the first coming. They understood the Messiah was going to come. They're the ones who gave us the Old Testament prophecies. Isaiah, Micah, Zech- or, uh, not so much Zechariah, but uh, the, the other prophets. Okay, Genesis for that matter, Genesis chapter 3, that there would be coming, a Messiah would be coming, all right? So the Old Testament prophet saw that. But the next thing he saw was the time of Jacob's trouble. He saw the tribulation period, because that's the, they're giving us that information. A lot of the Old Testament prophets deal with the day of the Lord. All right? So they saw this, and then they saw the second coming of the Messiah. And that is also mentioned in the Old Testament. So they had knowledge and prophecies having to do with the first coming. And they saw the tribulation and the second coming. But this period of time, the church age in which we live today, they did not see it. They did not know that was coming. Now you might say, well, did they know there was such a gap in between? The answer to that is no. Have you ever looked through a good camera that has a zoom lens on it? And let's say it has a long zoom lens. Let's say it's, it's uh, at least 200 millimeters and hope maybe longer, 300, 400 millimeters. And you zoom in and, and you see things. There's something here. It's really not that far. But then there's something way maybe across the lake or, or across the valley. But that telephoto lens makes things look like they're stacked like they're stacked one close to another. You don't see what's in between. You can't see the distance in between. This was the lens of the Old Testament prophet. This is the way the Old Testament prophets saw it. So when they talked about Messiah coming, yes, they understood this. They understood the time. This is when the day of the Lord begins, by the way. They understood that, and they understood the second coming of the Messiah. But they did not understand at all this age in which we live, okay, And that is called the church age or the dispensation of grace. Now, it's important that you understand that. It was Paul talked about. He says this period of time that we're living, this church age, this age of grace, was a mystery. Was a mystery. As a matter of fact, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And for the most part, John. Okay, there's a couple references. There's a reference certainly there in in, in John 14. But remember, John was written when? The Gospel of John was written, it wasn't written until around A.D. 90, A.D. 95, way down the road, okay? The nation of Israel was already dispersed at that point. Now, Jesus said in John 14, that is a reference there, that is a reference to the rapture of the church. But when Jesus talked about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke about him coming again, he was talking about this. And he talked about the time of Jacob's trouble. He was talking about this. He was not talking about the rapture of the church, which is going to take place somewhere in here. Okay, Why? Because everything to do with the church was a mystery. It was a mystery. This information had not been given. Do you get that? I hope you get it. That is one of the keys to understanding biblical prophecy. So number one, future judgment is coming. I think the book of Joel gives us a collection of several judgments and invasions of the day of the Lord during the seven-year tribulation period. Uh, So turn there over to Joel chapter 2, 
And this is what we see in the book of Joel. There are several judgments uh, referred to. All of them could be called the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. They would all, uh, Joel put them all within that or under that uh, title. And so there are several judgments that he mentions. And uh, uh, it's very interesting. I'll just let you know this, that uh, some of the, uh, the greatest, as far as I'm concerned, I, I have access to probably some of the greatest commentaries that have ever been written from a, a, a sound doctrinal position. And even the best Bible teachers disagree on the details of the book of Joel. Not easy to understand. And so what is that saying? Well, what it's telling me is this. This is multi-layered. What they're saying is not false. It's just that other things, what others are saying, are not false either. And all of what everybody's saying is true, whether the details specifically fit the scenario or not, uh, we're not totally sure on that. Okay? So when we get to Joel, it's talking about an enemy. Now, whoever the enemy is, we know it is a picture of the coming judgment on the nation of Israel, because the day of the Lord begins after the rapture of the church. Remember what Jeremiah called it? It was the time of what? Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble, which leads us to our second point, and it is this, the true church, and I'll define that in a moment. The true church, and that's not a denomination, will be taken out of the world before that judgment begins. All right? This is called the rapture or the catching away of the church. Understand the church will not be here during the seven-year tribulation period. We will be taken to heaven. Now, you might say, well, well, you said the true church is going. Yes. What is that? The church, the called out assembly, the word uh, church means, it's, it's a Greek word, ekklesia. It means a called out assembly. Okay? People who are called out of the world by God for a reason. How do you become part of the church? It's not through membership. It's not through baptism. It's not through giving money. It's not through giving a pledge. It's not by being water baptized. The way you become part of the body of Christ, the church, is by trusting in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Trusting in Him to get you to heaven. Trusting in Him that when He died on the cross, He paid for all of your sins. Let me illustrate it here. This representing you and me. My wallet representing our sin. We're all sinners. This is why we need a Savior, because we're all sinners. Yet God loves us. He hates our sin. The Bible tells us that heaven's a perfect place, and for us to get in, guess what? We have to be perfect, because if we were sinful and we entered heaven, we would pollute it. It would not be perfect any longer. So you can't get to heaven with your sin. God says because we've sinned, sin has to be paid for. And the scripture tells us the wages of sin is death. Okay? Now, no amount of good works will take away your sin. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, remember, the wages of sin is death. It doesn't say the wages of sin is doing good deeds. Good works will not save you. Going to church, being baptized, studying your Bible, you know, giving money, none of those things will take away your sin. Death is the only payment for sin. So if you're going to pay for your own sin, you'll have to die physically and then be separated from God for all eternity. God says, I don't want that for you. I want you to live with me forever in heaven. And so he has a plan of salvation, us being saved from hell to heaven. And he showed it to us when he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, this hand representing him, the sinless Son of God, the Messiah of the world, the Savior of the world. And when Jesus went to the cross, he went to pay for my sin, and he went to pay for your sin. How much? All of it. All of your sin was paid for when Jesus died on the cross. All of it. Not only what you've done, but what you'll do to the day you die. Remember, when he died some 2,000 years ago, all of your sin was in the future because you hadn't been born yet. So when he died on the cross, he took it all upon himself. He made the complete payment, leaving us nothing to pay for. And he rose from the grave to prove it was real, to prove it was true, to prove it was a done deal. 
And he is, all he's asking us to do is believe in him that he did that for us. And when we do, he gives us everlasting life. Look with me, hold your place here and look with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. It is a matter of receiving him as your Savior. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, what does that mean to receive him? Well, I love the Bible, how it just defines what it means and tells us what it means. In John chapter 1, look at verse 12 with me. It says this, But as many as received him, Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. That word even there is, is italicized in, in, the, in our King James Bible. It means it was just added, okay? It's, it's not there in, in the original text. It, the idea is specifically to them that believe on his name. How do you receive Christ? By believing on his name. What does that mean? Jesus means God who will save you. When you trust in him, you're trusting in him that he is God who will save you. You're trusting in him that he is God who is your savior. And so to get rid of your sin, friend, okay, all you need to do is trust in him as your savior and God will give you everlasting life. Everlasting. That means it never stops He'll never cast you out. He'll never lose you because if he did, it wouldn't be everlasting life. And Jesus is not a, not a, not a, a person who goes back on his word, doesn't lie, tells the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So when you trust in him, he gives you eternal life. He says he'll never cast you out. He'll never lose you. That's the best news in the world. And when you believe in him as your Savior, you are receiving him as your Savior When you do that, you become part of the body of Christ or the church. And those people are the ones who are going to be raptured out of the world before the seven-year tribulation, time of Jacob's trouble, the day of the Lord begins. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let me show this to you. This may be new. I I know it's, it's not new to many of you, but it may be new to some of you. But I do want you to understand these things. See, the man, one of the, my teachers and when I was in Bible college, uh, as a matter of fact, I just dreamed about him either last night or the night before. You might say, can't you remember? No, can you? <laughs> Probably not. You might say, no, I can't remember. It wasn't my dream. That's not what I'm getting at. <laughs> and I, I don't even remember what it was about, but it, we... I was actually talking to him. He, he referred to me. Now, he didn't know who I was. I was one of 1,400 students in Bible college, okay? He didn't know me by name. At least I don't think he did because I just wasn't a popular kid in school. Um, but I can't remember the interchange. Anyway, I went to go sit down, and he, re, he, he called me Tom, which freaked me out because I didn't think he knew my name. Anyways, I'm referring to Mark G. Cameron. Dr. Cameron, he was sort of the uh, senior theologian in our Bible college, and he had a saying, and it was this. He says, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. That's good theology, and that is who we're looking for. The upper taker is Jesus. Jesus is going to take us up out of the world before the seven-year tribulation begins. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 It says this, uh, he talks about in verse 13 that he doesn't want us to be ignorant about what's going to happen at the rapture. And then in verse 14, he says this, for if we believe that Jesus died, died and rose again, there it is again. How do you go up at the rapture? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? That he died for you and rose from the grave? Have you put your faith in him? You'll be included in what he's about to say. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. That's those who have died physically, including Dr. Cameron. His body may be in a grave somewhere, but he is with Jesus right now. Those who are asleep are those who have died before the rapture takes place during this age of grace, this church age, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those who have died, their bodies will be changed and resurrected. Now, I don't know if they're going to, you know, explode out of the ground or if it's going to be more of a spiritual thing that people aren't actually going to see. We just don't know exactly how that's going to be. I know there's movies about it. Spare me, okay? No one knows. Um, but this is what's going to happen. And look what it says. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain. In other words, those living. When Jesus comes, I want to be one. I want to be one. Now, I, 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 I'm ready to go home, be with the Lord. Any day he wants to take me, I'm good with that. But it's like, Lord, boy, it'd be so cool to go up at the rapture. And I've shared my heart so many times. I hope the rapture takes place some Sunday morning when we are here in church. Wow. We'll all go up together. I don't know all the details of that. I don't know if we're going to, if he's going to slow it down to where we can savor the moment or if it's just kind of, I know it's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So the change will take very quickly. And I think we'll probably go up at a pretty good pace. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to be where we'll be like this and all of a sudden, hey, 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 we're going up <laughs> slow. I don't think so. Could be, though. Maybe the Lord's listening and saying, I'll show you. That's exactly what I he can do what he wants. <laughs> we know we're going and we're looking forward to it. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Harpizo, okay, it means to snatch, to catch away. The Latin term is rapturo. That's where we get the word rapture from. People say, well, I don't believe in a rapture. It's not in the Bible. It is, it's just not, the word is not there, but the idea, the concept, the truth of it is, caught up is what it means. Then we, those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, in the air. He doesn't come all the way down to earth. We meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Chapter 5, verse 1. But, the thought continues. Of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Jump down to verse 9. For God has not appointed us, believers, to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. If you follow the chronology in 1 Thessalonians 4 into chapter 5, and the contrast between verse 3 of chapter 5 and verse 9, it keeps going, children of light, children of the darkness, we're not of the night, we're of the day very clearly talking about we are going out of the world before the day of the Lord takes place. But the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Why? Because the rapture comes suddenly. And then before you know it, the day of the Lord is upon mankind. So it'll be a surprise to the world to have all those people missing. How they're going to explain it, I don't know. I know there's been a lot of talk lately about aliens, right? And they'll probably say something like, you know, it was a quantum leap of evolution and the aliens came and took the trash out of the world because that's the way the world sees us, right? We're the off-scouring. That's what the scripture says. That's how the world sees us. So get those Christians out of the way. They're holding up progress. And so once we're gone... You know, they may say to you someday, you know what, I wish we could get rid of you Christians. It's like, it's coming. We'll be out of your hair, but you'll have a lot worse problems once we're gone. You need to listen up. Let me show you how all this fits together again. We haven't even gotten to Joel 2. We'll get there. Let me show you our other chart, future events chart. Let's look at this. Here's the events. First coming of Christ. Remember, the Old Testament prophets saw that. They understood Messiah would die. 
Then, this is what they didn't understand, the church age. This was a parenthesis. This was a mystery. The rapture of the church will take place. Okay? The seven-year tribulation period, that begins after the rapture. That's when the day of the Lord begins. At the end of that seven-year period, Jesus will come back and touch down on the Mount of Olives. All right, that's the second coming of Christ all the way to earth. Here we meet the Lord in the air. We go up. Here we'll be coming down with him. He'll set up his kingdom. He'll defeat the Antichrist and the armies of the world. And then he'll have his 1,000-year rule and reign here on the planet. We'll be part of that. It'll be the most awesome time that the world has ever seen, you know? I better move on from that. I'm getting so excited about this. I, you know, I, I can't wait for camp because we're going to be talking about all kinds of neat things at camp having to do with living in these last days and getting ready for the rapture and everything that's going to be taking place. So those are the future events. Now let's go to Joel. Joel, remember, is not talking about the day in which we live. Joel is talking about the judgment that is going to be coming on the nation of Israel. And it says in Joel 2.1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, okay, and sound, that has to do with Israel or Jerusalem, uh, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. It is near at hand. Now you might look at that and you say, well, wait a minute. How could Joel say that it was near at hand when you were, we're looking at something like this? Well, there was a judgment of God coming. There were invasions coming. You see the multi-layer thing? And no doubt he could call that part of the day of the Lord, but he was also projecting long term. You might say, yeah, but you're talking about, you know, almost 3,000 years later? Okay, between 2,500, 3,000 years later, at the end, uh, at, during the tribulation period. Listen, what does Peter say? Peter says, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. By the way, 2 Peter 3.8. Here's what I'm saying, folks. As God looks at time, remember, Joel was God's mouthpiece. God said, I don't have to, he, he didn't say to Joel, I have to explain everything to you. He said, this is what I want you to say. This is what I want you to write down, whether you understand it or not. And by the way, the prophets didn't understand everything that God told them, but they said it anyway. So what Joel is talking about, yes, he's talking about what is coming. And while uh, by the way, you see in verse 1, it says, blow ye the trumpet. Blowing the trumpet was to alert the people many times of impending trouble and also war. Now, while this could refer to the Assyrian invasion during the reign of King Hezekiah, which took place in 701 B.C., and by the way, that's covered in Isaiah 36 and 37, it is also a prophetic scenario in view also of Israel being invaded from the northern countries, including the area of Assyria. So do you see Assyria would come? Assyria would come in 701 BC, which is during the time of Joel, but also it speaks of a greater invasion that would come in the future. Assyria is the area where Iran is today. And by the way, could this be at least in part a description of the invasion of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38? I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying maybe it includes that as well in the terminology of the day of the Lord, because all of those things take place then. Ezekiel 38, 9, it says, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. This is talking about this invading army for the, from the north, which would include Russia, which would include uh, uh, Turkey and so forth. The, the Arab uh, nations around Israel are going to come and are going to attack the nation of Israel. It says, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land 
thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Now, why do I put that in there? Because now look at Joel 2, verse 2. What is the day of the Lord going to be? It's near at hand, Joel said. He's telling this to the people. And he says it's going to be a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall any more after it, even to the years of many generations. He says there's never been anything like it. There's never going to, there's, it's not going to be anything like it after that point. Now, if you have been through some of our studies in prophecy, doesn't that sound a lot like Matthew 24? When Jesus was talking about the tribulation, he said in Matthew 24, verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. See, these scriptures so parallel, they so beautifully cross-reference. There has to be reference there. Joel chapter 2, verse 3. This is interesting. A fire devoureth before them. The enemy that comes, okay? So they're coming into the land. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. Now, some of your commentators will say, well, this is just a rehash talking about the locusts of chapter 1. I don't think it is. I think this is talking about something far bigger, far greater that is coming down in the future. Okay? A fire devours before them. What, what kind of uh, a locust actually had fire going out? And behind them a flame that burneth, verse 4. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run, watch this, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains. Shall they leap? Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Now, while I know this says horses, and it may be that, okay, uh, the, the idea of, of horses here, the appearance of horses, I cannot help thinking about modern warfare. Things such as Cobra helicopters and so forth, and, and these kind of uh, uh, things that can actually do those kind of things, leap from mountain to mountain, okay, these ma massive invasions of, of armies coming down. And I know Ezekiel talks about horses and all that, and I get that, and maybe it is actually going to be horses. That's very possible. Or is it a description? See, folks, uh, I think we need to think at least about these kind of things because... Fire comes from out from the front. Behind, uh, as they come to the land, it's beautiful. They devour it with fire, and afterwards, it's just stubble. Horses can't do that. There's got to be something else involved. Now, some see this as continuing to talk about the locust, but chapter 2 indicates this is something yet future. Okay, the judgment of the locust had already taken place, and Joel uses the judgment of the locust as an illustration for a greater judgment coming on the world. So there's going to be trouble, trouble, and more trouble in the future for the nation of Israel. Verse 6, before their face, the people shall be much pained. Look at that. All faces shall gather blackness. That word blackness is an interesting word. It's the idea of being flush with anxiety or fear. Okay? They'll just be in dread. They'll be petrified of the judgment and the fire and the devastation that they're seeing. Now, this matches up perfectly with what we see in Revelation 6 through 19. Unprecedented judgment and chaos and judgment from God and armies fighting one another, devastation, billions and billions of people killed, 
all during that seven year tribulation period part of the day of the Lord. Verse 7, they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the walls. These are the ground troops. Like, like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Okay? They shall run it to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon, uh, up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Watch this, verse 10. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. Watch the language. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. This is amazing, which leads us to our third point, and it is this. There will be catastrophic disasters in the atmosphere. Catastrophic disasters in the atmosphere. Pastor, do you really believe this? I really believe it. Why? God said so. He has brought judgments and plagues on the earth before. I say, well, never anything like this. Yeah, and that's exactly what Jesus said. There would never be another time like this. There has never been a time like this, and there will never be another time like it. Listen, if I wasn't saved, I'd be scared to death. Turn, hold your place. Turn with me to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Remember what you just read. The earth shall quake, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Matthew 24 and verse 29. Jesus is speaking. He says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. This is towards the end of the tribulation. The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. It's coming. It's coming. Revelation 6.17 says, For the great day of his wrath, his wrath, God's wrath, is come, and who shall be able to stand? Of course, the answer to that is nobody will be able to withstand the power, the awesomeness, the strength, the justice, the righteousness of Almighty God. Back to Joel chapter 2, verse 11, it says, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Or the word abide here means who can bear it? Who can withstand this? Now you might say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. It says in verse 11, it's his army. Yes, because who is ultimately controlling the scenario? Who's controlling the play out of history? The playback. Who's controlling everything that's going on? Okay. By the way, who in Revelation uses demonic creatures and armies to bring people to the Holy Land for the battle of Armageddon? God does. You might say, well, they don't even believe in God. Doesn't matter. He is the orchestra leader. He's the one who brings it about. He's the one who brings it to the finish. Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He will have his way. He will get everybody he needs to to the battle of Armageddon, and he will take care of his enemies there. How's he going to get them there? They're in rebellion. Leave it to him. Leave it to him. So in that sense, I believe it's saying that they are his army, even though they're invading, yes, but ultimately, God is allowing it to happen. It's being orchestrated by God. He's in control of the situation. He is also in control of the judgment. And by the way, didn't, didn't the Lord in the Old Testament tell Israel, if you rebel towards me, I will send your enemies toward you? 
I will bring the enemies against you. God told them that. See, everyone ends up being a player in the history of the world. Which leads us to our last point, and it is this. The only answer then is Jesus Christ. Friend, I say this with all sincerity, whether you're here today or watching. If you don't accept them as your Savior, you're going to accept them as your judge. Okay? If you don't accept them as your Savior, you're going to accept them as your judge. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. I'd rather be on his side than against them when these things take place. Here's the beauty of Scripture. Okay? You don't have to go through the tribulation and you don't have to end up in hell when you die. Escaping hell is free because Jesus paid the price. Think about it. It's free. That's why it's a lame excuse for people to say, well, I can't believe that. I can't believe in that stuff that you talk about. Oh, I can't accept that. Why not? We're talking about a f- getting out of your situation, getting out from under the condemnation of God, and it's a free gift bought and paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, it isn't God looking at your sin and just saying, oh, no big deal. I don't care. It's not a big deal. No, sin has to be dealt with. The good news is Jesus dealt with it. He died for your sins, for my sins, and he offers us forgiveness and eternal life as a free gift. And when you trust in Christ as your Savior, you will also escape the tribulation period for free. Double salvation. And it's a gift. Why would anybody turn it down? Look with me to John chapter 5 in verse 24. Jesus said this, Verily, verily, it's the old King James way of saying, Truly, truly, okay? I really mean this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, Right right then, everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That where it says, is passed from death unto life, okay, that means it is a once and for all thing that takes place, never to be repeated again. Because the benefits are forever of that. It's a done deal. It's called the perfect tense. The perfect tense. It's been completed, and its benefits remain. When you trust Christ as Savior, your sins are forgiven. God gives you eternal life, a home in heaven. You become a child of God. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you. You have a new nature, okay? So many benefits, we couldn't even list them all. All simply by you trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. So have you done that? If you haven't, will you do it today? Let me tell you, friend, the future is absolutely frightening for the one who rejects Jesus Christ. I urge you today to trust him as your Savior before it's too late. The day of the Lord is right around the corner. You don't want to be here for that. Let's pray. With heads bowed today, please, and all eyes closed, before we go to prayer, Let me uh, just encourage you right now, friend, if you haven't already, that right now you would put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Right now, you would trust in Him. Between you and Him, all He's asking you to do is believe that when He died on the cross, He paid for all of your sins. That's all. You're putting your faith in Him as your payment for sin. And when you do that, the payment He made is good on your behalf. All your sins are taken care of. He'll he'll not hold them against you. You're forgiven. And it's a gift. Would you trust Christ as your Savior? Right where you sit. Now, if today is the first time you ever understood that and you trusted Christ, could I pray for you as we close? I'm just going to ask you to slip up your hand. You don't have to do that, okay? Raising your hand doesn't get you to heaven. 
It just lets me know that it made sense to you. And today, you understood it for the first time. You trusted Christ. But I'd love to pray for you. I won't embarrass you. I won't call you out by name. But is there anyone who would say, yes, today, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'd like prayer. Would you just slip it up, put it down? Is there anyone? Pray for me. Today, I trusted Christ. Pray for me. For those of us who are believers, let me say this before we pray. Friend, these are days of urgency. You might say, I'm afraid of what people think of me. Quit thinking about yourself. Think about their destiny. Think about what's coming. This is all true. This is all true. We need to be faithful with the gospel. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for telling us the truth. And I do pray that everyone here has put their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. I pray, Lord, that if they haven't, that they would do it before they get up, knowing they could die before they ever get home today, knowing that the rapture could take place and all the believers are taken out and they are left behind. What a scary thought. Thank you for loving us and saving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.